Spoiler warning, I am going to be waxing lyrical here at full volume. 100% candelabra full of melted poets. However, on the topic of spoilers, I'm going to do everything I can to tell you as little as possible about the contents of this box. If at times that comes at the cost of clarity, I can only apologise. Let's go. I cannot express enough just how fascinating and unusual and wonderful this game is. Screw it, I'm just going to put all of my hearts on all of my sleeves at this point. This is the first time that I've genuinely considered that we might need another tier for our Shut Up and Sit Down recommends badge. Screw it, I'm, I'm giving it two. This game gets two of the badges, all right? I don't know what I'm doing, but I'm doing that. This game is an evolution of its genre in a very real sense. It isn't a rapid burst of wild mutation here. You're looking instead at a complex web of tiny, subtle tweaks to conventions and player expectations that creates something that looks so familiar that you'll happily invite it into your home, but in fact is so alien that before you know it, you might be on a flying bicycle or you've been abducted and they're doing something to your, your bottom. And if you're not familiar with my flavor of criticism, that's about as high as praise gets. But what on earth born is it? Earthborn Rangers, kindly provided by publishers Earthborn Games, is a cooperative campaign card game for one to four players. You and your friends are gonna play as the titular Rangers going on an adventure on an earth that's been sort of reverse fallouted? The humans of this earth realized that everything was going down the pan, so your ancestors retreated to vaults, leaving machinations and systems running for gosh knows how long to rewild the planet, restoring it back to a lush natural health. Now, much, much, much later, humans have returned to a planet that is bountiful, mysterious, and occasionally dangerous. As the rangers, it's your job to wander about and look out for people, check people are okay, and just generally try and protect these ecosystems that were so very almost lost. The game begins with each player outfitting their ranger, building out a deck that represents their character with skills and equipment they'll play from their hand, but also the core attributes that define their ability to do different things. Awareness, fitness, spirit, focus, tag yourself. I'm none of these. These numbers dictate which cards you'll be allowed to add into your deck, but more importantly, the number of these energy tokens that you'll have available to spend each round. These energy tokens power absolutely everything you do in the game. You're going to use them to play cards, but also to tackle challenges. What represents a challenge? Absolutely everything! Hashtag relatable content. You're using beefy red fitness tokens to overcome obstacles and carve a path towards a location you're currently heading towards. The yellow power of spirit allows you to connect with the world around you, calming the sentient creatures that might otherwise prove a bit much. Calm down, caustic mulcher. No mulching today. Okay. Green awareness can be spent to avoid beings, exhausting them temporarily so they can't cause you any chaos yet. And blue focus gives you the ability to breathe, take stock, look through your deck a bit and draw some new cards. But these are just the four generic tests that you can do at any time listed on this handy reference card. Outside of that, the entire game is just riddled with different unique little tests. You've got them on animals, characters, flowers, piles of logs, piles of dishes. Each test has a trait type, a corresponding icon and a difficulty level that you'll have to match or beat. Attempting these tests works pretty much as you'd expect. You always have to invest one token to try a thing, but after that you can bump up your odds of doing it by adding more tokens or cards that have the right symbols on them. And when you've committed enough things that you hope you've done enough to be successful, you'll flip a card, Gloomhaven style, to add a spicy little modifier just to keep you on edge. But there are no traumatic tentacle immediate failure moments here. The numbers can go up to plus two and down to minus two. So you can always choose to take a slight risk or mitigate luck entirely by investing heavily. And there's also this little symbol on the bottom of the card that we're going to come back to later. Succeeding at these tests pushes you forward. Distract that animal. Draw this card. Clean those dishes. You don't actually clean dishes, I don't think. Tom just really wanted to do that a bit. I don't. I need to do my dishes. <laughs> but being too stingy and failing can have consequences. Oh, I tried to pick that flower and a thorn just pricked me. I just said something uncomfortable to a traveling companion. Of course, sometimes the core resource of just your human attributes isn't gonna be enough to get through all the problems. You're gonna need stuff. 
Sometimes cards you play will be equipment, like trail markers to help show you the way, or technological gloves to scramble up cliff faces. But other times, these cards might be companions, memories, or just ideas. Once everyone's run out of things to do, you refresh. You take back all of your energy, you draw another card, and then the game takes a go, throwing all sorts of new problems at you. So far, Earthborn Rangers probably looks and sounds an awful lot like the excellent Arkham Horror Living Card Game, which actually got re-released recently. Check out our review. And that's partly because this game is made by a studio headed up by a veteran of Fantasy Flight games. And these comparisons clearly feel expected. Earthborn Rangers, if you're not sure at any point, has something called the delightful rule, which is whatever the best thing that could happen, well, that's what happens. A direct contrast to Arkham Horror's equally wonderful, yeah, whatever's the worst thing that can happen right now, that's what happens. So tonally, Earthborn is more Avatar The Last Airbender to Arkham Horror's Cabinet of Curiosities. And if it was just a less oppressive, more expressive version of that game, it would already be great. But it's, it's just loads more, it's so much more than that. Because at this point, you probably feel like you've got a pretty good sense of what Earthborn Rangers is. And I'm here with some cool news. You do not. I have not been straight with you. This game is so much weirder than it looks. But it can't be that weird, can it? Are you telling me that this guy gets cautioned by the police for loitering outside of a leisure centre? No, that's such a weird thing to say. Why would I script that? But it is genuinely really hard to describe what this game is without pinwheeling around like a conspiracy theorist. It's easy to explain how you play the game in a very linear fashion, but explaining what it is, is really difficult. And the designers are obviously aware of this. The uniqueness of the game's design and the designers' intentions for it are explicitly discussed within the manual. It's an unusual and brave decision to just be so open with players about how you hope they will engage with your game. And most of the time, it's not a practice that I'd engage with. I think that the majority of the time, I prefer it when games are able to communicate with you, the player, about what they are through the medium of you playing them. I, 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 dis, I, dis, I disagree with that. I don't know, I don't know how or why preci precisely, but you, I, I definitely don't, don't, don't agree with that sentiment. I don't agree with that No. I think if you've got a little thing at the start of the manual that explains like, here's what you should be thinking when you when you sit down to this box, I, I, that's really helpful. Cool. You, you can keep going with the review. Yeah, I just, all right. I just Tom to, disagrees. Just that's wanted, fine. I just wanted to say that. Hi, guys. See, see you. See you. See you. But crucially, once I started playing, I understood why they did this. It wasn't navel gazing. It was asking players to keep an open mind, to stick with it, give this game time. And I'm really glad that they did that because honestly, initially, there were some things about it that I did find slightly annoying. Much like with Arkham, there was a lot of sticking my nose in the manual because I wasn't quite sure about something and the flow felt very stop and start. That became increasingly frustrating in Arkham's living card game, which kept adding new rules like an unobserved child adding toppings to ice cream. But in this case, it isn't that there are too many rules. It's that in the early stages of the game, you go to look something up and you rarely come away from that with that moment of going, ah, it all makes perfect sense now. And that's because this world is weird. What the f is that? Is it supposed to be doing that? Yeah, so I've checked and this cre this creature does do that when this happens. Right. So that, yeah, that is, that is what it's supposed to be doing. I don't know how it's useful, but. No. I don't think it's a problem either. Yeah. But it isn't just the world that's odd. The flow of the game is unusual too. <gasps> Look, hello! There's a world map and each of these different locations represent missions, do they? No. Each location you're traveling towards is represented by a constructed mini deck of cards you might encounter. You've got the biome type you're traveling through and then either unique cards for special locations or a few cards at random from this deck of special unique things that you'll bump into over and over again. It means that as you play, you'll see familiar faces, but maybe also you'll keep meeting this thing again. Cool. I love repeatedly meeting this thing. The longer you hang about in one location, the more of these path cards you're gonna be drawing. And it also means that the more things you attempt, you're gonna be drawing up more of these modifier cards that are just gonna keep everything rolling and changing, including the weather. Also, your characters get tired. In addition to your draw deck and your hand of cards, you've got two different flavors of personal bin. The discard pile of things that are absolutely spent and the one that shows everyone else just how knackered you are. 
suffering fatigue has you blindly taking cards from your draw pile and putting them into this temporary bin. But there are all sorts of ways that you can soothe fatigue, which takes these cards out of the bin and puts them straight into your hand. Oh, I feel like a thousand British dollars. Oh, say can you have 10,000 British dollars now? No. Why? I'm sorry, but no. Oh, say no. what? Knowing that this bin is only ever temporary makes you quite flippant about being a bit dangerous. Sure, being injured means you get fatigued more quickly, and you get fatigued from like, you know, leaving an area maybe without saying your goodbyes properly to things like wolves. Or a bush. Or a bush, maybe. Maybe. Eventually you're going to have nothing left in your deck to draw up, at which point you are done, it is bedtime, go straight to bed, that's the end of the day. Ending a day is also usually where you end a session, and it's something you can do at any point. You can be like, that's a good place to wrap up, we end the day. And the main thread of this story continues from day to day, but individual little tasks and quests that you pick up along the way often have to be completed within that same day. Which means sometimes you end up planning trips that are frankly audacious. So we have to get back to Spire before the end of the day uh, to do that thing, but that guy wants to go fishing at Golden Shore. If we go via the mountain, we might get a better view on the paths which could speed us along there. And then I reckon at Golden Shore, there's gonna be someone with a boat who could bring us back. But we could go through the boulder field and we kind of know what's around there and by the market. I think we're gonna have enough time. And the complexity of all those interactions is able to come about because each of these unique cards is a lot bigger than it looks. Every unique place or thing you encounter has a number on it with a little bit to read aloud, based on whether it's the first time you've encountered it, whether or not you have a history with it, all sorts of things. These snippets of text are always simple and short, but it's the potential for depth that is so exciting. Sometimes you turn something and it's just a little bit of flavor text for a new location. Other times you might have multiple pages of sprawling adventure. You never really know, it's spicy. It's also just super elegant and efficient. Instead of having loads of envelopes and boxes of hidden unlockable stuff, you just have this sort of semi-unknowable booklet and then a small selection of these double-sided cards that are able to represent all sorts of different missions when attached to other things. These words like confront, lure, search, journey, or just helping hand can be used to describe so many different types of little missions when attached to a person or a place. This not only leads to a game that's amazingly broad whilst being relatively light and svelte, it also means you can't even guess at the shape of the campaign and, and where things might be going, what you might end up doing. But what about all of those non-unique cards that you're also going to encounter? Each of the game's ecosystem has its own set of things going on within it. Some places are dangerous. Other places are honestly pretty chill. Maybe you've got like a baby deer and, and some a bush, a bush. And oh boy, it's ridiculous that I haven't been able to get around to this yet, but all of the cards interact with one another. Those symbols, you're gonna go through all of the cards on the table and look for any matching symbols and activate those things. The weather's gonna progress. Oh, it's getting rainy outside. That predator is gonna attack any prey. And if there aren't any prey, it's gonna attack you and more harmless creatures will just munch, 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 munch those berries that I was actually just about to collect and eat myself. Things will sometimes cascade chaotically, leaving the situation suddenly slipping out of your control. Other times it's just really funny. At one point, my teammate when playing Ket, attracting a series of predators, whilst I pick some flowers and pose for a painting. They were, they were all right, they'll be fine. The way that all of these cards interact with one another is almost always more interesting than you expect. And it's a cliche, but it really does help the world feel wild and alive. And this game is so good, it's so, this game is so good. Here's a concrete example. This odd dear dog thing will sometimes get spooked if there's an intimidating presence in the area. There's also a chance it will attract nearby predators, keeping them away from us. And finally, maybe we've got trouble. If a red symbol appears on a flip challenge card and this creature is already injured, then all of these creatures in play will get panicked and thrash about hurting themselves and you in the process. But uh-oh, look who just turned up last turn. 
this thing's activation means we'd also get hurt if there were any food items currently in play. But thankfully, oh, Kevin, you've equipped some biscuits. The more you play this game, the more you realize that your tools are only useful if you know how to use them. And mostly that comes down to understanding and leveraging the ecosystems that you're moving through. It means you get stronger and more useful within this world, not by leveling up and getting new things, but by having a better understanding of the world that you're inhabiting. The story frames you as these rangers heading out on their first expedition, and that is just perfect. What's our job? I don't, I don't really know. Just, just head out, see what's going on, check that folks are okay. All right. Right from the start of the game, you're geared up with some pretty gnarly stuff, but your characters, just like you as players, uh, maybe a little bit clueless. And I want to give a really brief shout out to the way that you make characters in this game. It's really neat. Basically, you go through and it tells you just pick things on vibes. Like, what do you like the look of? Don't think about the deck, just what speaks to you. Take those things. And then afterwards, you pass the cards that you didn't choose around the table and the rest of your team get to draft some from those, which means you already have a connection to other players. You don't know exactly what they can do, but you go, oh, you got those boots. They're cool. I was going to get those. They're cool. It's lovely. The freedom you have whilst playing this game, though, is just striking and strange. You can literally just ignore the tutorial mission if you want and wander off. The game will react to that accordingly, but you can do that. Perhaps you're going to spend ages just hanging around in one location, trying to dig through that deck to find someone, something. Or maybe you're in a hurry to get across to the other side of that lake and you're doing everything you can to just scout out a route and leave, getting through each location quickly. I've had sessions where the whole time we've just been at one, maybe two locations, and sessions where we've been through like five or six in rapid succession. And when you start to actually see the full shape of this thing, that's where all of those frustrations I mentioned earlier just melt away. I made the mistake of looking at this game as if it was a series of scenarios, when it isn't. It's a sandbox. Those creatures earlier that just seem pointless where you meet their predator. Okay, their behavior makes a little bit more sense. You, you find the place that they call home. Right, okay, I get it now. There's still no way that we can make use of that though, unless, oh, <laughs> we could. Uh... All of these specific traits and classifications on the cars just seem excessive until you realize that that's it. Those words provide you the entire framework of what you can and can't do in any situation. If it has that word on it, then yeah, you can interact with it in that way. And because this world is really interesting, we've had so many times playing it whilst we've gone, hang on a minute, that? No, that doesn't make sense. Hmm. And then you look at the art again, and you look at it closer and you go, oh, and then suddenly this world just explodes to life, animated in your mind. It's not like you're being forced to leverage your own imagination to inject life into something that isn't there. It's just by trying to work out how you would interact with a thing like that in that way. The answers are always quite obvious and they are always a delight to envision. And to go back to those eureka moments when you realize that something you've observed previously as a natural phenomenon could be harnessed that the more you explore and learn about this world, the better you become at your job as a warden of it. Kiss all of the chefs. That's exciting. But it also means that you start as players to bite off a little bit more than you can perhaps chew. I really don't want to spoil too much about this game because it's a delight and discovering it for yourself is a big part of that. But I'm just going to tell you a little bit of a story about a sequence of events that all collided in a way that made me go, Oh gosh, this game is, is really quite something. We were trying to track down a nasty mega predator, effectively. We've been catching different kinds of prey, small creatures, bundling them together in the hope of making a tasty package that might mean that this huge thing would come out and play. Very exciting. Then the weather got bad and we were on our way back and things went bad. There were some floods. And suddenly we got a message from the Rangers HQ saying, you got to come and help these people. There's a problem. You've got to run around. We are scrambling through the rain and through the mud. And then just at the point at which we turn up and everything is going to hell, would you look who it is? And then we had to decide for ourselves, do we just ignore it? Do we run away from it? Do we let it go? But we'd spent so much effort 
setting the snare, setting the trap, and just watching it all collide in a way that was completely organic. The game hadn't planned, it was just that we'd engage with those systems in that order, and it happened for like, mm. And the fact that we'd taken all of the deer and kept them in a little enclosure so we could get this big thing to come out, it meant that when we were going through the areas where the deer usually were, they weren't there because we had them which meant those ecosystem decks got nastier it was all predators because we literally taken all of the deer and when there's no prey the prey is you ah it's these emergent moments that make this game something truly so special and i am not above begging you to just go and buy it so i can continue to get expansions and more things for it for years and years to come just do that buy it for me thank you but crucially, it isn't a sandbox where you are sat waiting for these moments. It's just a consistently cool and pretty interesting world to explore. Opportunities for curiosity are constantly presented to you and they're always rewarded. Sometimes you get stuff, sometimes you just learn something about the world that you might be able to use to your advantage, and other times you just find out a thing about the world. And you're like, huh, cool. And that means you remember the creatures from the different ecosystems. You remember the people who can help you and where they live. You remember the pros and cons of different routes and start naturally discussing the game using the same language that the characters might. And I've got to say, the use of writing and language in this game is superb. As an example, one of the keywords on the cards is persistent, which means that when you leave an area, that card will come with you. It's a sort of label you might see on a particularly dogged predator. But I couldn't stop laughing when I saw this word on the card of a particularly annoying young teenage girl who follows you around and just asks you questions. Persistent. Yes. Mm. In fact, all of the rules on her card are just funny. The thing you can do as a challenge to get rid of her is to ask her about her adventures in the valley. So basically you just need to talk to her for a bit and then she might leave you alone. In the meantime, often whenever a sun symbol appears in the game, you discard one of your progress or a token from either a plant, an insect, or a bit of your gear. In my mind, the head cannoning for this immediately was just having this person follow you around and go, what does that do? And just expending charges on your useful equipment. It's perfect, it's brilliant. It does so much storytelling with very, very little. Fantasy Flight games, in my mind, set the gold standard for rules that came to life when paired correctly with flavor text and art. And this game feels like an evolution of that. All of the game's mechanics are purposefully descriptive, and the best example is the way it handles positional information in the field. You've got within reach or along the way, and they're terms that provide players with a framework of what they can and can't currently do based on where they are. But if I say a predator from along the way suddenly pounces within reach, that's a sentence that's evocative and descriptive, but it's also literally just the rules. I just read you the rules of what we now have to do to continue the game. And that's a subtle thing, but to, to combine both of those things into one sentence, that's huge. That's, that's, that's huge. Everything here just feels evocative and sharp, a Swiss army knife of flair and function. And the choices they've made in terms of what language they use, they just feel so specific. The thing I love, particularly about within reach and along the way, is that they don't just suggest proximity. Those phrases can also be used to describe the passage of time. Like things within reach are about to happen, things along the way, those things happen later. And that just gives the whole game an added sense of momentum. And momentum is what this game is all about. It does feel like a game about traveling and going on journeys. I have played far too many games that come with a big book of things to look up like this, and too often, if I'm honest, I feel like I've just been hoodwinked into reading a screenplay. There is a care towards language in this game that runs right the way through it. It doesn't want to waste your time and it doesn't want to pull you out of the experience. And once you've got the rules down, which takes a little while, it's a game with serious momentum. You're always on the move. Doesn't matter what you're doing, there's always a place that you are going towards, a location on the horizon, and it's always something that you have chosen. It is an alarmingly successful piece of game design that at first made me nostalgic for an era of games that just don't exist anymore, but then unfolded to become this strange, unique mutation that tore up all of the expectations I had for the genre and mashed them up into a beautiful gift. Cheers. We talk a lot about the pairing of mechanics and theme, and over the past few years, I've played plenty of games with bright, 
interesting themes, but too often they just feel like shiny wrappers. You're given a backstory and you're told who you are and what you're doing, but then you're just hitting stuff or moving cubes around. Earthborn Ranger's ideas are rooted deep within the game's DNA. It expresses itself perfectly through the ways that you interact with its systems. There are bits that you read out sometimes, sure, but the vast majority of the storytelling in this game happens through play, through you interacting and reacting to these systems. And the theme of this game isn't just perfectly expressed by its mechanics. It extends to the actual production of the game. We spoke to the studio's lead, Andrew Navarro, on our podcast a couple of years ago, and we learned some fascinating things about industry production standards and how many parts of the cardboard creations that we buy and love aren't actually recyclable. It was a bit shocking. It's a machine, and yeah. the smoother it can run, the happier the accountants are. What they actually ended up achieving was even more impressive. When I saw Andrew for the first time, again, years later, he cheerfully handed me a copy of this game and smiled as he said, when you've had enough of it, you can bury it. It's entirely biodegradable. I'm not gonna bury it, but I could. Beyond that, they've gone out of their way to ensure that the production and shipping of this game is as localized as possible, cutting down on the invisible but huge environmental impact of doing things in the way that are normally done. Even the optional luxury components are made of wood. They're really, really good as well. I'd, I'd highly recommend them. But maybe you don't care about any of that stuff. Maybe you're rolling your eyes at this lanky streak of fuzzy milk banging on and getting excited about sustainability. And if that's you, fair enough. And I could sit here and say that, you know, that's small minded or foolish or that you're just maybe afraid of the reality of the way the world is and living in some strange fancy, whereas I'm just a complaining idiot. But what I prefer to talk about right now is the ways in which those production values are an essential part of what this game is and so connected to why this game is brilliant. Because newsflash, sustainability stuff and getting it right is a massive pain in the ass. People don't use existing industry systems because they're the best systems, they use them because they're the existing systems. It's easy. And I can't judge that. I love easy. Easy is great. Hard is, it's hard. Making board games requires a whole chain of people and companies and standardized practices vastly cut down on the myriad of ways that things can go wrong. But sometimes standardized practices are just dumb. We spent decades using USB before we realized that it doesn't need to be one-sided. You can have it like we got the USB-C now. Either way is fine. We spent decades with one that you could only put in one way for no reason. And all it takes is one example of something different being possible. And everything can change really quickly. But that single example of something else being possible comes at the cost of just so much time and energy and work. But it's being in that mindset, having this zealous refusal to just do the thing the way it's always been done and pushing for something different. It's, it's why this game is so good. It's the same mentality. It's the definition of visionary, being able to see something that doesn't quite exist yet and to grasp at it and pull it into existence. And in terms of the production systems, that's already happening. Other publishers are already going, oh, you, you can do it like that instead, can you? Huh, we're gonna do that too. The world, a better world is possible. We could just change stuff. It's huge if true. I can't resent anybody for choosing to take a route that is easier. It's a, a pretty tough time right now in 2024 to be creating media without compromise. It's harder to do it without compromise and the compromises that you're expected to make are bleaker than they've ever been. And that's why I think it's so important that when flowers do manage to come up through the cracks, despite that pressure, that we celebrate them. And this is a beautiful flower. You said, you said it. After a decade of playing and reviewing board games, I don't think I've grown jaded, but there's definitely a small voice in my head that sometimes says, oh, you know, maybe, maybe things are just not ever gonna be as good as they, they were. Maybe it, that's it. And that's really just a side effect of, of getting older and becoming increasingly wrong about everything. And Earthborn Rangers is a pointed reminder of just how wrong that mentality can be. I don't know what the future of games will be, but today, this is it. If you love games and you care about games, this is something you have to play.
And as a side note, I just want to say that I feel incredibly thankful to be able to do this. Like we are mostly supported by people who watch our show and there's some links in the description about how you can support us and chuck us some cash if you like what we do. It's an unbelievable privilege for me to be able to go on this huge, massive deep dive, sharing this joyful thing with the world. So thank you for giving us this uh, compromise free position situation we love it and this isn't the last time we're going to talk about this game i do not think because tom is that my is that that's your cue tom, tom's your cue it's my cue tom sorry uh, hello tom he's he's been playing as well he really likes it this is my copy it's his copy i, I bought it in his house <laughs> for fun <laughs> we're going to talk about this on a podcast we again for sure and we're going to definitely have a bit more of a deep dive and like if you're not too bothered about having things spoiled for you we're going to get very excited about some of the Immersion systems. We're not even going to spoil that much because I've just not. I'm not even played that much of it. I, I just mean, know it's really good. I'm in a similar position to when I reviewed Gloomhaven, and mm. I hadn't seen a whole bunch of that when I reviewed it, and I haven't seen a whole bunch of this either. And that's fine because it's great, and I can't wait to see more it's of just it. Really it's, it's just really good. It's just really good. Also, this game reminds me a lot of a video game mm. called Rain World, and mm. I wanted to sneak a little section into the script where I talked about that. I might not have done that. Mm. If I, I might not have done it. If you haven't seen that already, then it means it wasn't there. Instead, it's going to be a little bonus bit, a little extra bonus video maybe I don't know. Scenes or, or, thing. or we might just talk about it on the podcast yeah anyway thank you so much for watching uh, we love being able to do what we do and we like you as well probably probably have a good day bye see ya probably bye